Okay, guys, it's time for another episode of Trek Yards. Welcome back, Commander Cockings. Always a pleasure to see you, as usual. Yep, great to see you, Kevin Foley. And today's going to be a good day because we've got a guest joining us later on, the designer himself, to discuss this ship design. That's right. We will be joined for the design portion of today's show by Rick Sternbach, who is the brain behind this incredible ship. Now, Commander, what is the topic of today's episode? Well, sir, today we'll be looking at the future Federation time ship, the 29th century relativity. And yes, I even have a model. Thank you, Eagle Moss. Oh, that's awesome. One of my favorite ship designs. You <laughs> I'm excited to learn that. more that's about exactly. her. I don't always say that. You say it quite a bit. But I got to say that after writing this script, this episode can be turned into our very first Trek Yards drinking game episode. So go get your favorite drink, such as Saurian Brandy, Romulan Ale, Klingon Blood Wine, the green stuff that Guinan keeps under the bar, or something non-alcoholic for anyone underage, of course. Since Ale, yeah. And I'd like you all to take a swig every time we say the word temporal. So without any further delay, let's get right into it. The USS Relativity, or NCV-464439-G, is a 29th century Federation Wells-class starship operated by Starfleet. The name Wells-class, of course, refers to the science fiction author H.G. Wells, who wrote The Time Machine. The ship was under the command of Captain Braxton, with the ship itself being commissioned by the University of Copernicus. Now, the ship consisted of very advanced temporal sensors and scanners. The scanners were capable of scanning any particular area of space throughout all of space-time. These sensors were capable of monitoring the time stream for any temporal changes. Hmm. The ship also had temporal transporters that were capable of beaming any individual in virtually any point in space and time. But I'll talk about that in more detail later. With a length of 193 meters and having only nine decks, the ship was specifically operated by the Temporal Integrity Commission, Division of Starfleet. So just to put the relative size into context, at 193 meters, it's about the same size as the Nova class Starship 181 meters, and only 11 meters longer than the Defiant, the smallest Federation Starship 170 meters. That means relatively is a fairly small ship, as must speak to the ship's efficiency on its missions doesn't need a huge ship, um, large crew, or anything beyond the compact nature of what it already has. Indeed. The ship was dedicated to protecting the timeline from dangerous incursions. Its systems were far more advanced than anything available to Starfleet in the 24th century. Mm -hmm. The famous Federation L-cars computer interfaces were replaced by T-cars, or Temporal Computer Access Retrieval Systems, which could be operated by touch or by simply waving a hand over them. Mission Impossible style. The ship was also equipped with incredibly sophisticated sensors that could monitor the entire time stream and detect any changes that may occur with time, <laughs> uh, and obviously relatively being unaffected itself through its temporal shielding. The majority of these sensor suites were concentrated in the arrays around the front and sides of the ship. These were extremely powerful and capable of monitoring events uh, hundreds of years in the past as well as thousands of light years away, which is very impressive. The scanners could pinpoint very specific times and locations to scan from any residual temporal tampering and had an extremely long range, uh, not just through time, but physical space as well. So really advanced, guys. And yet Nero still exists. Anyway, the <laughs> ship had a temporal warp core, which drove its large central temporal impeller drive. The standard warp nacelles were replaced by more wing-like attachments on the side of the vessel, with the standard impulse drives still providing the ship's sublight propulsion. No information on speeds could be found in my research, yeah. but we, were luck we are lucky enough to have Rick on later as a resource, and we will ask him that soon. And I'm sure we'll find out some great information. Yeah. Matter for the engines was brought in through the large intake on the very top of the ship and just behind the main temporal warp core. This and this. Uh, um, this is comparable to the Bassards in earlier Starship design taking in matter, although the relatively could gain all of its fuel from this process. That's pr so fully self-sustainable and green. Wow. <laughs> Even though the entire ship was capable of traveling through time, the Temporal Integrity Commission preferred to send smaller one-man vessels such as the Aeon or simply transport a small away team or a single individual whenever possible to avoid too much temporal contamination, since the Temporal Prime Directive is a rather important mandate. And also this is the uh, NCVG, so they've, they've learned a lot of lessons by the G, unless they get Thanks. blown up every year, but I mean that would be unfortunate. I don't know. Anyway, the ship's hull was specifically designed and built to travel through time, and as such had carefully crafted temporal geometry and contours. So that's right, guys. This is what a true time ship looks like. Sexy. <laughs> that's rad, man. That's rad. 
In order to make the journey through time, the ship had to generate a very specific temporal field. To do this, the ship's temporal matrix had to be carefully calibrated or the journey may have or catastrophic circumstances. We can see this when the time ship Aeon arrives in the 29th century with an incorrectly calibrated matrix and the final result was an explosion that destroyed the entire solar system. Small mishap there. Oops. Yeah, it happens. And although, as with all Starfleet missions, the mandate of the ship was peaceful, it was well armed and consisted of several disruptors positioned at various points around the hull. The primary, more powerful disruptor was located at the very front of the ship's nose section. It also has what looks like phaser strips on the hull, but I could not find any specific information on them or on the total number of disruptor emplacements or torpedo launchers either. Uh, so we will discuss that with Rick in just a little bit. The ship was also equipped with facilities called Holomatrix rooms, which are the 29th century version of holodecks. And I'd be certainly interested in knowing how they're more advanced, because how the holodecks seem pretty good when we, when we had them. Maybe they're fully tactile and, and real beyond it. Maybe they have a... I don't know. Obviously, we know the, the um, mobile emitter exists 29th century tech, so maybe there's... I don't know. Um, they were, of course, not only used for crew recreation, but also as a training simulators for operatives that are being sent on various temporal missions. And since the ship is from the future, with records of all past starships, and, as we said earlier, amazing scanners that can probably detect almost anything anywhere in time, it's fair to say holometric rooms can recreate almost any location, and such were perfect tools for agents. So maybe in st the way they're more advanced is they actually scan <laughs> a certain building in the past and then oh that'd be interesting so it's recreate it's, it on per, like a molecular level so rather and, than basing off some sort of 3d geometry in the computer it you it links directly into the scanners and just does a full slide. well they did say it could scan a specific points in history and thousands of light years away so why not i mean if you if you want your simulation to be as accurate as possible that would be a way that those rooms could be much more advanced, I think. And then if you wanted to make sure, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to stop a certain incident, then you just scan that point in time and you have all the exact people where there should be, so, uh, and you know, the, the rubble's falling down in the right place, you know, not to trip, you know, that sort of... That's interesting, I like that. Yeah, because yeah, even like you said, you could scan the exact moment they're going in so they know exactly where everyone is. If there's a cat in the room, you know, they would know all this stuff. So it, it, it's that synergy of technology rather than the advancement of the f actual hardware? Seems likely. That's a great idea. Nice theory, Stuart. Nice Thank theory. you. <laughs> but one of the coolest features of activity uh, is definitely the extremely advanced temporal transporters. One of these was located directly on the bridge for ease of use. Um, and the idea of having a small transporter pad on the main bridge is actually something that was considered for both the Enterprise refit in the motion picture as well as for the Enterprise D uh, in TNG. However, we digress. Ah, I see what you did there. Digress. Go backwards. Ah, that's clever. You didn't even know you did it, did you? Nope, because you wrote it. <laughs> anyway, these temporal transporters, of course, allowed members of the crew to beam to pinpoint locations in time with ease, even to the microsecond. Wow. Yeah. It is generally thought that the ship could accurately beam people within about five centuries, but that is never really specified. Only five? Okay, so still some more work to be done in temporal transport technology then. <laughs> Although then the easy fix would be to bring them relatively closer to the desired time zone and then beam from there. So it really isn't a limitation, really. It's... Yeah, when you look at it that way, it's pretty easy to fix that. I mean, yeah. there probably are limitations as far as transport technology goes. So and that I'm, makes sense. And I know we'll ask Rick about this, but I've got some ideas of why that might be, so I'm, I'm sure we'll get into those later. Yeah. Now, before, <laughs> before our transport was initiated, the ship raised shields and targeted a specific time and location. Now, so they can beam through shields now, I well, guess? I, I assume, well, yeah, that's probably one of the more... Well, they're temporal shielding, so maybe that helps with the temporal sending the signal to... Uh, that. Yeah, what I would guess is that temporal shielding, because now you're, you're interfering with time, so the temporal shielding has to come up. Otherwise, if you stepped on that you know, butterfly, whoops, we're now all blue Andorians, damn, that mission went wrong. So it must be some, <laughs> you know, protection from the timeline. And as you say, I think there was a, there's a ship, or, or one of the designers we talked to, where they, they theorised that... Uh, a signal you can bounce on the shield and it, and it um, concentrates and helps to magnet, magnify yeah. a signal. I can't remember where yeah. that's from, but maybe that as well. Uh, Interesting. Yeah. So when the operative was in the past, contact with them was maintained using the ship's temporal communication system, which was generally audio only. Uh, I'm sure they could do video, but we just never saw it. Uh, never saw it. And this was routed through, as with all things, the operative's combat. Two large circular rings on the upper hull to either side of the main 
temporal um, pillar drive yep, are the primary temporal field generators, with the smaller ones located just beside these being the secondary field generators. The bridge, of course, is front and center on this design, right in front of the glowing blue temporal warp core. I think it's fair to say that before people complain about the warp core being a sitting target, remember, 29th century time ship. I don't think anything in the Trek world could even come close to getting close to this ship unless they want it to. Come on, so far advanced. So I think it's fine these things are open. And it's probably got extra shielding, to be fair. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, On the bridge, the dedication plaque carries the Albert Einstein quote, the only reason for time is to stop everything happening all at once. However, on the actual plaque, it credits the quote to E.M. Roche for some reason, which I talk a little bit more about my theories about that later in the discussion part. It's an interesting quote as well. I wonder why. Hmm. It's an awesome quote. (laughs) Great way to explain time. Yep. And this was the seventh vessel to bear the name Relativity according to the Starship's dedication plaque. But judging by the registry number, it seems to actually be the eighth, and of course named after Einstein's theory of relativity. Hmm. Maybe there was a temporal accident, so there was seven. I, I... Maybe one got wiped from the timeline, so they had to build the next one, even though it was launched before they, the first one was. They just made a G to honor the one that disappeared from the entire time stream. Who knows? But it's interesting. They... Do you think then that I mean, the, the lifespan of all the other enterprises to get that A, B, C, D is isn't super long but it's certainly enough years so i wonder is the wells class again time it's difficult to say but was this in service for 50 years then or is it such that whenever a ship gets destroyed it goes back to the moment it launches so they initially so they print out or whatever another ship to replace it which then actively goes out in the timeline that's a neat idea actually and just because the temple shields may fail at some point, it gets wiped and they can probably detect that. Because, I mean, again, the base that would launch these would also have temple shielding. So maybe it's just a case of, oh no, the reactor went critical, let's bring out a new one. Hey, and, and maybe they've got all the same crew members because they can beam them off. I don't know. It's Or they're taken from an earlier part of the time or later part. I don't know. Time. It's difficult. It's complicated. <laughs> exactly. The ship also appears in Star Trek Online in a fun mission in an alternate reality and a playable version of the time ship recovered from the Tholian assembly, much like they did with the Defiant in Into Amir Darkly, hmm. with all the advanced technology stripped down, just leaving the space frame. This was then recovered by Starfleet and retrofitted with modern technology. It became a science vessel and had a new crew complement of 250 personnel, which could be the same as the relativity, we just don't really know 100%, and armed with anti-proton beams and chroniton torpedoes. I've, I've played the mission where you, we get to see it, and I, I, it, was a, uh, it was one of the times where I came back into the game after a long time, I didn't even know the mission existed, played it, and it's got one specific hook, and then suddenly, boom, relativity, I'm like, whoa, that's awesome. Uh, so that was a lot of fun. I haven't played the actual ship as a, as a playable, cap, playable ship, though. Uh, have you managed to play them? No, I haven't. I've played the mission, but I haven't played the ship. Yeah, I like the idea of it being stripped away, although it seems odd to me. And bloody Tholians. Seriously. We t- mentioned that in our episode about them. They bloody always Tholians. have some kind of weird dimensional or time thing going on. And they always get the upper hand as well. 24th century to 22nd century and then 29th century. They are amazing. We totally <laughs> underestimate these guys. Seriously. They're clever little crystals, aren't they? <laughs> the only piece of advanced technology remaining on board was a tipless cylinder which when installed aboard the Wells class, and this was done in Star Online, allowed them to form a temporal backstep, which had the ship rewind time for around 13 seconds. This ability also used the beryllium uh, in the Tipler cylinder, just as we saw the beryllium core in Galaxy Quest power the NSCA protector, which also had the ability to reverse time by 13 seconds, thanks to the Omega-13 device. But anyway... Paying homage to Galaxy Quest, I absolutely love so. it. <laughs> Very nice, though. Right, well, I'm excited because now it's time to speak Mm. with the designer himself and get some of those little questions we had that popped up answered. And there's a lot for the ship because it's a a pretty interesting ship. So please welcome back Rick Sternbach to the show, everybody. Always a pleasure to have you join us, Rick. Hey, guys. Good to see you again. Yeah, welcome, Rick. As you know, we're doing the Relativity. Can't stop playing with the the ship. So, Rick, in regards to Relativity, um, in doing our research of the ship, there are a lot of specifics missing. So we'd like to talk... You know, the ship with you through and get you to maybe answer a couple of questions we had about the design. But first, sure. um, when did you hear uh, that she wanted to do a 29th century time ship? And what was your first thoughts on her? Um, how to make something so far in the future? 
Well, I, you know, I think the, uh, the, the little time ship Aeon preceded yep. the relativity, okay, because we got more into the temporal ranger guys, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in the episode that had the relativity. So when I approached the styling of it, it was, uh, you know, I used the Aeon as a, uh, as a starting point, okay. <laughs> Uh, and since the relativity was supposed to be a much bigger mothership time ship from you know from around the same era, uh, you know I borrowed a lot of the same sort of sleek uh, yeah, elements. So took the you know the the familiar let's say you know the nacelle caps, the Bussard collectors. They usually glow like a sort of an orangey pinky color. Uh, so for the Aeon, I moved those to the tail uh, and turned them, you know, uh, turned them flat. So at least there would be some kind of a little uh, recognizable hmm. color or shape or something that would say, okay, oh, this is Starfleet and not, you know, Romulan or something. So when it came time to do the, uh, the relativity, it was, okay, it was like, okay, take the stylistic elements of the Aeon and just multiply them make it a sleeker, more slippery looking ship than anything Starfleet had in the 24th century. Uh, and, and, and that's pretty much how, uh, you know, how I approached it. We did a few uh, uh, passes on, you know, getting sketches approved. You know, then I launched into uh, some, uh, some blueprint drawings. I gotta say, I can definitely see that. The 29th century, the designer says, okay, crew, I want a slippery design. Mm. That is that's the that's what we're going for, guys, and that do, actually does make a little bit of sense. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's you know it's got a lot more curves, uh, and yeah. you can tell that it's okay. It's not from around Voyager's mm. time; it's somewhere else. You know, right, seeing the final result, both Samuel and myself really love this design. It's a great looking ship. Um, now, what were your inspirations besides the Aeon that drove it? It, I, it has more of kind of like a stealth fighter feel. Hmm. I'm wondering if that was some kind of influence there. I get little stylistic cues from lots of different places. Uh, you know, some of the uh, some of the concept aircraft uh, that you know people think were coming out of Area 51, uh, or some of the uh, you know some of the contractor hangars in uh, in the desert somewhere. A lot of the the very high Mach number uh, concept aircraft, you know, have, have been really cool looking, okay? Mm -hmm. And it's and it's hard not to think about those lines, those, mm -hmm. those streamlined surfaces when designing a sleek starship. Even if the thing flies in the vacuum of space, we're talking science fiction, and, you know, it's got to, it, it's got to look like it works, and it it's got to look cool. Um, so, Rick, did you have any input on the internal bridge set being used, um, or even how the 20th, 20th century T cars um, would look? Uh, any thoughts on the aesthetic, or even the new uniform design? You know, what the set designers came up with uh, uh, for the Relativity Bridge, I thought was, you know, it, it was an extension of, of Starfleet. All I really could do was kind of look over their shoulder and say, oh, that's really cool. Like a lot of these, these, uh, these starships, it was a real team effort. Uh, you know, some of us are handling the the outside, some of us are handling the insides. We 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 get to see how the thing develops over you know over a few days. So I, I thought all of the all of the styling for the 29th century you know came together really nicely. Okay, one thing that is obvious in the design is that there's no external warp engines with fairly visible bizarre collectors or blue glowing warp coils as we see in previous Federation starships, even up to the 26th century Enterprise J. Uh, this ship instead has a temporal and color drive. So what are your thoughts on the ship in terms of propulsion? Are the actual warp nacelles integrated into the wings somehow? And can it still achieve warp or does it use the temporal and color drive to exclu exclusively to travel through time and space? Uh, do you believe the 29th century Starfleet has kind of done away with nacelles as we know them? I put some of the Bassard type technology. Uh, you know, I, I rotated the stuff 90 degrees, and uh, you know, everything is integrated into the wings. I'm sure that there's some kind of you know fantastic, cool power source inside the temporal main... warp core, Rick. Huh? Temporal warp core. A temporal warp core. Yep. Uh, yeah. Okay. If or you say so. Core. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, I'm sure, I'm sure it would have, you know, a warp slash FTL, um, you know, to get around. Uh, you know, they, they, they probably can fly just about anywhere they want to. You know, and forwards and backwards in time. Mm-hmm. Um, and do you think that's all part of the temporal impeller drive, or do you think they need a separate warp well, sure, drive? Well, sure, sure. You know, if you have the, you know, I, I can probably say without being uh, too far wrong, if you have the temporal impeller drive, you know, warp drive is like nothing. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's easy. It comes along for the ride, you know. Now, do you think that all future Starfleet ships are, have warp hmm. or time capabilities or just hmm. the specialized oh i think the the, the temporal uh, you know the 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 office of temporal affairs or hmm. whatever they called it uh, you know i'm sure those are the guys charged with you know fixing the timeline hmm. i think you know probably most other starfleet ships are are just you know warp and impulse too much power for just regular captains, I guess. Yeah. Well, you know, you, you also have to think of you know, you know, if 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 you put together the Star Trek universe uh, with with any kind of realism, they probably can't afford to build as many engines as they want of every single type. Okay, that that makes stories interesting. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. I can see some admiral, you know, at at some some meeting saying. Look, the allocation this this uh, this year doesn't let us build any more temporal warp engines. <laughs> Those damn budget cuts. That's right. Absolutely. That's right. Oh, that that's cool. Um, so, do you think there'd be a, now a warp impeller drive, or do you think it's do you think the warp drive as we know it is pretty much the FTL of choice, even up until maybe the 29th century? Well, I'm you know I I. I'm willing to bet that that there are different ways of mixing matter and antimatter together. Hmm. Um, you know, maybe you could get into a dark matter engine, and uh, there are all sorts of things that are being discovered now. Hmm. Okay, that might lead to you know higher energy output. Um, okay, matter and antimatter. That right now seems to be like the top of of a reaction that you can get from the stuff that we have on hand or or that we can make in, in the trek universe yeah you know we know matter and antimatter uh if we throw new things in like okay every, you know some of the scripts talked about slipstream drive and quantum something drive and quantum, uh, quantum worm wormhole thingies uh, to me they're all kind of variations on a theme can you get into crazier stuff sure why not chroniton drive there you go chroniton particles why not <laughs> but that's time oh, that, that is this shit. exactly right. it's time yeah yeah but don't mix chronotons with dark matter because it gets very bad <laughs> sounds good so one thing that actually stands out about the ship and i i changed my perspective when i was writing this when we we're doing this episode um is yeah. the size of the ship when you see it on screen, it feels like a pretty decent size ship. Medium, not huge, but pretty decent. But at a size of 193 meters, compared to other ships, it's far smaller than I thought. So talk us through why you made it the size you did, and what that may mean for the future of Federation designs, or at least time ships. I, you know, I tell you, when I when I did the, the blueprint drawings, hmm. uh, you know, top view, bottom view, front and, front and back, you know, I didn't have an absolute dimension in mind um i think a lot you know some of the cues in the let's say the cg render some of the cues w- would be the window sizes mm. the lifeboat hatch sizes i would have to go like i say d- dig through the box to find the the drawings um a lot of times you know in episodic television um you know, we didn't have time to to measure everything and to say, okay, in universe, this is how big this ship is. And we especially didn't have time to do that with a lot of the alien ships. Hmm. Okay, you you got to see them for like five minutes. I, and, I think in the in the episode, you get to see it for three shots relatively. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's it's that's yeah. it. I mean, you you can get a, a fairly decent sense of of the size of relativity um and uh you know if any of us were to do um you know some 
some kind of a, 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 a licensed publication where we had to nail the dimensions, you know, it, 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 it could be done. So, hmm. but why did you end up going for that exact length? Because that is, you know, less than double the size of the Defiant. I mean, it's about the same size as a Nova class. It is a small ship. Well, you know, you, you could rationalize a smaller ship by saying, you know, in the 29th century, they have, you know, smaller, more efficient vessels, especially if you have to go punch through the continuum, you know, to, to or get smaller temporal footprint. And when you go back in time, less chance of ruining yeah, oh, sure. time stream. Yeah, yeah, I'd go for that. There you go. <laughs> well, guys, hope you enjoyed part one. Yeah, Stay me tuned. too. I, I, I enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it. You know? Good, so did I. But there's a part two on the way soon. <gasps> but you guessed that probably with the title. Um, but yeah, next week, guys, tune in for part two, the conclusion of this wonderful episode. See you then.